Hi guys, here is Dr. Benaduce. Today we will be talking about joints. The first thing we need to do is to define what a joint is. And a joint is the place where bones join together. And another word for joint is articulation. Now, two bones will never touch one another. And between them, we will find cartilage, we will find ligaments, we find connective tissue connecting two bones. So, in a joint, we have a bunch of different types of connective tissue joining together. We have bones, we have cartilage, we have ligaments, which are all connective tissue. Now, there are several ways to classify joints. And the first way we will look at is the joint classification based on what we find connecting the bones in that joint. And based on this classification, we have joints that fall into the fibrous category. We have joints that fall into the cartilaginous category. And we have joints that fall into the synovial category. In fibrous joints, we have dense fibrous connective tissue connecting the bones in that joint. Specifically, dense irregular connective tissue. And in dense irregular connective tissue, the fibers are irregularly arranged. And that makes the tissue strong in all different directions. And that makes fibrous joints very difficult to pull apart. And as a consequence, these fibrous joints are very strong. And they permit very little or no movement between the bones in the joint. And depending if we have a very narrow fibrous joint or we have a wide, large band of fibrous joint between bones, we classify fibrous joints into different types. And we have suture fibrous joint, syndesmosis fibrous joint, and gomphosis fibrous joint. A suture fibrous joint is characterized by a very narrow fibrous connective tissue between the bones in that joint, such as the sutures we have between our cranial bones. A syndesmosis fibrous joint is characterized by a wide fibrous connective tissue between the bones in the joint. And you can see here that we have the example of a syndesmosis fibrous joint found between the ulna bone and the radius bone. And this wide band of connective tissue is specifically named antebrachial interosseous membrane. Interosseous, inter between osseous bone. So it's a membrane between bones. And we have the, basically the same arrangement when we look at the interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula in our leg. Now, the way I like to remember syndesmosis fibrous joint is by remembering desmosomes. Remember desmosomes that we covered in the different types of cell junctions? So desmosomes, they were like button-shaped structures that worked like Velcro. And that is the way a desmosome connects two adjacent cells, two cells that are side by side. So I remember this wide interosseous membrane between two bones as a button-shaped Velcro that is wide connecting these two bones in the joint. And a button-shaped Velcro is a desmosome. And that's the reference that makes me recall that interosseous membranes are examples of syndesmosis fibrous joints. Gumphosis fibrous joint makes you recall the word gum, and the gumphosis fibrous joint is found deep inside the gum because it is found between the root of the tooth and the bony socket. Another type of joint based on what we find between the bones is the cartilaginous joint. Now, with this name, guys, you can expect that in the cartilaginous joint, we will find cartilage between the bones. And we have two types of cartilaginous joints. We have the synchondrosis cartilaginous joint, and we have the symphysis cartilaginous joint. And the main difference between synchondrosis cartilaginous joint and symphysis cartilaginous joint is the type of cartilage we will find. In the synchondrosis cartilaginous joint, we find hyaline cartilage. 
which is the most abundant cartilage in our body. And it is tough, but it's also kind of flexible. In the symphysis cartilaginous joint, we find fibrocartilage. And fibrocartilage is the fibrous one, is the tough one. We find fibrocartilage between the two pubic bones. And since this is fibrocartilage, this is a symphysis. Since this is a symphysis between the two pubic bones, this is named pubic symphysis. So it tells you that that is a symphysis. We also find fibrocartilage between the bodies of our vertebrae. And this thick pad of fibrocartilage is very important for shock absorption between the bodies of our vertebrae. Consequently, this thick pad of fibrocartilage, which is commonly called as intervertebral disc, inter means between, invertebral, vertebra, intervertebral disc, is another example of a symphysis. And since this is a symphysis between two vertebrae, this is named intervertebral symphysis. Now, going back to synchondrosis, cartilaginous joint, guys, synchondrosis has the root chondro in it. And chondro means cartilage. And you remember that the most abundant cartilage type we have in our body is hyaline cartilage. Now, hyaline cartilage is the one that's tough, but it's kind of flexible. So if you go ahead and you press in your thoracic cage and you feel that cartilage pieces moving where you're pressing, you can conclude that that is hyaline cartilage. And consequently, it is hyaline cartilage connecting your ribs to the sternum. So this joint then is made of cartilage, specifically hyaline cartilage between our ribs and the sternum is a synchondrosis cartilaginous joint. Now, when I went over bone formation and we talked about the endochondral ossification, I told you that the mold of the bone was made from hyaline cartilage. And that as the bone developed, we ended up with a plate of cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis of long bones. And this plate was called epiphyseal plate. So the epiphyseal plate is a plate of hyaline cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis of a bone. The epiphyseal plate is also considered a synchondrosis cartilaginous joint. And the last type of joint based on what we find between the bones that are joining is called synovial joint. The synovial joint is the most common joint in our body. And what is very characteristic of a synovial joint is the presence of a cavity between the bones in that joint. So we have an articular cavity. And that cavity is filled up with a fluid that is called synovial fluid. And when we look at a synovial joint, we see that we have the bones connecting in that joint and the articulation, the joint, between the bones has a capsule. And this capsule is called articular capsule because it's a capsule of the articulation. So it's the most outside part. And this capsule, as you can see here, attached to the periosteum of the articulating bones. And the capsule firmly connects the articulating bones together. Now, when we look at the inner layer, of this articular capsule, what we see is a membrane. And this membrane lines the interior of the articular capsule, as well as the parts of the articulating bones that are not covered with articular cartilage. And what type of cartilage the articular cartilage is? It is hyaline cartilage. Now, when we look at this membrane, this membrane has cells that are capable of producing the fluid. And the name of the fluid is synovial. So this membrane that is capable of producing the synovial fluid is called synovial membrane. And the synovial membrane 
has blood vessels. It is vascular. And fluid filtered out of our blood plasma together with components produced by specific cells found in the synovial membrane make up the synovial fluid. And the synovial fluid fills up the synovial joint cavity. And when the synovial fluid fills up the joint cavity, it can deliver nutrients and oxygen to the articular cartilage of the bones in that specific synovial joint. Because, as you remember, cartilage is a vascular. Now, the synovial fluid, if we are able to look at it, you would see that it is very similar to uncooked egg white. And if you ever had the opportunity of trying to grab uncooked egg white, you probably notice that it slides a lot. And with this type of consistency, the synovial fluid provides a high degree of lubrication within the joint cavity. And consequently, bones in a synovial joint can move freely and quietly. Now, we have different types of synovial joints. And these types are based on the shape of the articular surfaces of the bones in that specific synovial joint. And when we look at these different shapes, we see that some synovial joints are slightly movable and other synovial joints are extremely movable. And they are, in fact, the most mobile joints in our body. And there are six different types of synovial joints. And you remember their names by remembering. Please help pivot condoms sales back. And the six types of synovial joints are plane, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, and ball and socket. Now, let's take a look at the six different types of synovial joints. And the first one we'll talk about is plane. Plane synovial joints were named plane because the bones in this joint, they have a flat surface or a slightly curved surface between them. And when we have this shape of bones forming a joint, these bones can move in a plane. And the movement happens when the surface of one bone glides over the surface of the other bone. And that's the reason why a plane synovial joint is also called a gliding synovial joint. So we say plane joint or gliding joint. Plane synovial joints are found between the bones that are making up our ankle. And those bones are called tarsal bones. And a joint between tarsal bones would be named inter between tarsal joint. So intertarsal joints are examples of plain synovial joints. Now, do you remember the name we give to the bones that make up our wrist? They are called carpal bones. And joints between carpal bones are called intercarpal joint. And an intercarpal joint is also an example of a plain synovial joint. Another example of a plain synovial joint is the sternoclavicular joint. And as the name implies, the sternoclavicular joint is found between the sternum and the clavicle. Now, when we look at a plain synovial joint and we evaluate how the bones in that joint are moving, what we can see is that in some plain synovial joints, the bones in the joint can move side to side. In other plain synovial joints, the bones can move back and forth. In other plain synovial joints, the bones can move side to side and back and forth. And in other plain synovial joints, we can even see a very little rotation happening between the bones in that joint. Now, when we look at the movement, of the bones that are in a joint, and we see that those bones can only move in a single axis, 
And an axis is a straight line. So the bones in the joint can just move side to side or they can just move back and forth. We call this type of movement uniaxial. Uni for unique. That is just one way those two bones can move, glide one over another. When we look at the movement that's happening between the bones in a joint, and we see that those bones can move side to side and back and forth. They can move in two different axes. We call that biaxial. Bi, because there are two different axes, those bones in that joint can move. Because bi makes a reference to two, like a bicycle has two wheels. And when we look, at the movement that happens in a joint, and we see that those bones can move in more than two axes. For example, those bones can even rotate in the joint. We call that multiaxial because there is a multitude, several directions that the bones in that joint can move. And with all that being said, you can conclude that when we are talking about plain synovial joints, what we can find is uniaxial, biaxial, and also multiaxial movements. And that's the reason why plain synovial joints fall into the categories of uniaxial joints, biaxial joints, and multiaxial joints. The second synovial joint we need to talk about is the hinge joint. The hinge synovial joint was named hinge because the convex part of the bone in the joint articulates with the concave part of the bone in that joint. And when that happens, those bones can move like a hinge door. So they can have that opening and closing motion. And in our body, can you think of articulations that we have this opening and closing motion? Well, one is obvious, is the elbow joint. So the elbow joint is an example of a hinge synovial joint. Another one is the knee joint. We can flex and extend our leg at the knee joint. Consequently, the knee is also an example of a hinge synovial joint. And another good example is the joint that we have between the phalanges of the fingers and toes. And since it is a joint between phalanges, we call that inter between phalangeal joint. Now, an opening and closing motion like a hinge door tells us that that joint can only move in one single direction, in a unique direction, which is opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing. And as a consequence, the hinge synovial joint has an uniaxial type of movement. And as such, the hinge synovial joint falls into the category of uniaxial joint. The next synovial joint we have is the Pivot joint. As the word pivot implies, in a pivot synovial joint, we will have one of the bones in the articulation turning to the right or to the left inside of a ring that's formed by this other bone in the articulation in a ligament. So literally, this bone in the center rotates, turns to the right, or to the left within the limit of this ring. And a classical example of a pivot synovial joint is the joint that we have between C1 and C2. So the first and second cervical vertebrae. Now, do you remember the other name C1 receives? C1 is also called Atlas, making a reference to the Greek mythology where we have Atlas holding the earth on his back. And in the case of anatomy, we have C1, the first cervical vertebrae, holding, sustaining our head, which would be the earth. 
Now, C2 has also a different name. Do you remember what the name of C2? It is axis. And C2 receives the name of axis exactly because of its role in the pivot synovial joint. When we look at C2, we see the dense, and the dense sticks up. And the dense goes and connects with C1, with the atlas, right here. And if you pay attention, you can see that we have the atlas bone and we have a ligament right here. And the dense of C2 is in between. This arrangement allows C2 to turn to the left, to turn to the right. And when C2 turns to the left and turns to the right, we are rotating in an axis. And that's why C2 is named axis. Now, when C2 turns to the right and turns to the left, that is our no motion. We turn our head to the right and to the left. That's no motion. So, this pivot synovial joint between C1 and C2 is what allows us to do the no motion. And the name given to the pivot synovial joint between the atlas and the axis is atlantoaxial joint, making a reference to the atlas and to the axis. Another example of pivot synovial joint is the proximal radial ulnar joint. And when the head of the radius bone rolls to the right and rolls to the left over the ulna bone, we are capable of turning the palms of our hands anteriorly and posteriorly. Now, as you could notice, in the pivot synovial joint, we can move to the right and to the left. We can move in one single axis. Consequently, the pivot synovial joint has uniaxial type of movement. And when a joint has uniaxial type of movement, it falls into the category of uniaxial joint. Another type of synovial joint is the condyloid, also called ellipsoid joint. As we covered before, a condyle is a smooth, rounded surface. And in the condyloid synovial joint, we have a condyle, a smooth, rounded projection in a bone articulating with an elliptical, shallow socket in another bone. And now you figured out why this joint is named condyloid or ellipsoid. An example of a condyloid joint is the radiocarpal joint. And obviously, the radiocarpal joint is between the radius bone and the carpal bones, specifically the scaphoid and the lunate. And as you can see, we have the elliptical shallow socket of the radius bone articulating with rounded smooth projections of the scaphoid and lunate carpal bones. And the same type of arrangement is seen between the metacarpals 2, 3, 4, and 5 and the phalanges. Consequently, another condyloid synovial joint example is the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Now, I have one more example of condyloid synovial joint, and this is the most obvious one. Look at this. We have here the mandible, and the mandible, as you learned, has the mandibular condyle right there, a rounded, smooth surface. And the mandibular condyle articulates with a depression in the temporal bone. And this depression is elliptical and it is relatively shallow. So it is an elliptical shallow socket. So what we are seeing here is the mandibular condyle of the mandible articulating with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. And clearly, this is an example of a condyloid or ellipsoid synovial joint. And how do you think this joint is named? This joint is named temporal mandibular joint. And when we look at the type of movements we can find, what we see is that we can flex and extend if we're looking at the metacarpophalangeal joint, for example, 
we can flex and extend our fingers and we can also move it to the right and to the left, which would be called abduction and adduction. And this tells us that we have movement in two different directions. Consequently, the condyloid synovial joint is characterized by having biaxial movements and as such, it falls into the category of a biaxial joint. Another synovial joint is the saddle joint. In a saddle synovial joint, what we see is the ends of the bones in the articulation resembling horse riding saddles. And we find the saddle synovial joint between the thumb and the trapezium, the carpal bone trapezium, because the trapezium is always under the thumb. And this saddle joint arrangement is what allows our thumb to easily touch all the other fingertips. And a joint between the trapezium carpal bone and the metacarpal is called carpal metacarpal joint. And the movement that we find in the saddle synovial joint is the same movements we found in the condyloid joint, which is flexion and extension, abduction and adduction. Consequently, the type of movement we find in a saddle synovial joint is biaxial, which means that the saddle synovial joint falls into the biaxial joints category. And the last synovial joint we need to talk about is the ball and socket. As the name implies, in a ball and socket synovial joint, we have a ball-shaped head of a bone fitting into a socket of another bone. And we find the ball and socket synovial joint in our hip when we look at the head of the femur articulating with the acetabulum of the oscoxa bone. And also we find the ball and socket synovial joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula, which is our shoulder joint. And the shoulder joint is specifically named glenohumeral joint making a reference to the glenoid fossa of the scapula and the head of the humerus. Now, since the ball and socket synovial joint is literally a ball in a socket, you can expect that this type of joint will allow movements in a multitude of axes, in several axes. And that tells us that the ball and socket synovial joint allows multi-axial movements and, as a consequence, the ball and socket synovial joint falls into the multi-axial joint category. Now that we went over the six different types of synovial joints, I would like to share with you a little tip that will make your life much easier to remember the degree of movement each of these synovial joints has. Following the same order of our mnemonic, please help pivot condom sales back the first one, plain synovial joint, has uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. The second one, hinge, and the third one are uniaxial. The fourth and the fifth one, condyloid and saddle, they are biaxial. And the last one, ball and socket, is multiaxial. And this is how I do to remember this order. The plain synovial joint is the first one we study. So it introduces us to the three different types, the uniaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. Now we have uniaxial, the root uni has three letters. So the first three will be uniaxial, plane, hinge, and pivot. Then the word biaxial has the root bi, and bi has two letters. So the following two will be biaxial. And then we only have one left, and this one has to be multiaxial. Now, to make things a little more interesting, we can also classify joints based on how freely movable that specific joint is. And we have three terms. One, that characterizes joints that do not move at all. And those are called synarthrotic joints. So the term synarthrosis means that that joint does not move. And if you look at the word, guys, arthro is making a reference to articulation, and seen means together. 
So what is telling us is that the articulation is together. It is so close that those bones cannot move. And based on all the joints that we looked at, do you remember which were the ones that could not move? Those were the suture, which is a type of fibrous joint. Also, we have the joint that connects our tooth to the bony socket, and that is called gum phoses. Remember the gum? So these are both types of fibrous joints that do not move. Consequently, suture and gum phoses are types of synarthrotic joints. When a joint can partially move, so it can permit some movement, we call that an amphiarthrotic joint. So, amphiartrosis is the term that refers to joints that can have a very slight movement. Now, do you know what the root amphi means? Amphi means both. Like an amphibian is an animal that can live in the water and also in the land. It lives in both. So, amphiartrosis is the joint that is both. It seems like it does not move at all. But in reality, it moves. So it has a slight movement. Now, out of the joints we covered before, which ones would have a slight movement? If we go and look at the joint, at that membrane that we find between the radius and the ulna, that joint moves a little because we can move the palms of our hands anterior and posteriorly because the radius bone basically rolls over the ulna bone. And if the radius bone is capable of rolling over, this membrane, which is a type of fibrous joint, is specifically syndesmosis, is an example of an amphiartrotic joint. Now, if you recall, when we went over cartilaginous joints, we saw that we had the symphysis, the pubic symphysis, and the intervertebral symphysis. And those are slightly movable. Consequently, symphysis is also an example of an amphiartrotic joint. Another type of cartilaginous joint that we went over was synchondrosis. So, chondro means cartilage, syn means together, and in the synchondrosis, we have hyaline cartilage bringing things together, like the cartilage we have between our ribs and the sternum. And you can go ahead and you press that joint. You can see it slightly moves. Consequently, the sternocostal joint, which is the joint between the sternum and the costal, the ribs, because we know the word costal means ribs. So, the sternocostal joint, which is an example of a synchondrosis, cartilaginous joint, is an example of an amphiartrotic joint because it has a slight movement. Now, the only thing missing is how we call joints that permit free movement. And these joints are called diartrotic joints. So, diartrosis is the term we use when referring to freely movable joints. And the six types of synovial joint fall into the diartrotic joint category. And you know that because when we were going over the six different types of synovial joints, we characterized them into uniaxial, biaxial, or multiaxial, depending on how many axes they could move. So, obviously, synovial joints are freely movable joints, and they can even move in multiple axes, depending on the type of synovial joint we are looking at. Now, guys, let's break down this word. The word diartrotic starts with the root di, and the root di means two, correct? Now, I'm pretty sure you heard before the expression double joint, and even though the expression implies that these people have double joints, have extra joints. No, they do not have extra joints. And the huge flexibility observed in double-jointed people is due to the overstretch 
of ligaments. It's like the ligaments in that joint are loose when we compare to the ligaments that we find in a person that's not double jointed. Now, when you remember that a double jointed person is referring to a person that has lots of flexibility in a joint, you remember that double is two. Consequently, the type of joint that is freely movable will start with the root that is characterized by double, by two, and that would be the diartrotic joint. And we have uniaxial diartrotic joints, we have biaxial diartrotic joints, and we have multiaxial diartrotic joints. So those were the joints that we listed under the synovial joints. And remember, if you follow the synovial joints mnemonic, you remember that the first three are uniaxial, the next two are biaxial, and the last one is multiaxial. And the first one, which is the plain synovial joint, has all the three different types in it. Now that we learned the different types of synovial joints, and we know that synovial joints are freely movable joints, and as such, they fall into the diartrotic joints category, it's time for us to learn the different names we give to the movements that happen at synovial joints. And this vocabulary is very important. So when I say flexion at the knee joint, or I say abduction at the wrist joint, or I say medial rotation at the hip joint, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it is fundamental that you have a very clear concept of what the anatomical position is. And if you don't remember that, you go to the anatomy introduction class and you watch that again. Because all the movements that we'll be talking today that happen at synovial joints are in relationship to the anatomical position. So to learn about the different movements, we will look at a person from the anterior view, which is basically the anatomical position, and we'll look at a person from the lateral view, which would be looking at the same person in anatomical position, but now instead of looking at the person anteriorly, we are looking at the person from the side. Now, I'd like you to imagine that we have a line passing in the middle of the person that we are looking anteriorly, and another imaginary line that is crossing the middle of the person that we are looking from a lateral view. And these imaginary lines are placed in the long length of the human body. And a line that's following the long length of the human body is called, in anatomy, longitudinal axis. So let's get started with the different types of movements. Abduction and adduction. Guys, here we have the imaginary line. When we move a limb, for example, away from the imaginary line and we move it laterally, we call that abduction. And it's very easy to remember because when you are abducted, you are taken away from your home. So when you're taking the upper limb away from the midline, this is abduction. Now, when we are bringing it back, you are adding it back closer to the midline that is abduction because you are adding it back. So we have abduction and adduction at the shoulder joint. And I told you before that the specific name for the shoulder joint is glenohumeral joint, which makes a reference to the glenoid fossa of the scapula and the head of the humerus, glenohumeral joint. Now, we can have abduction at the hip joint and we can have adduction at the hip joint. We can have abduction at the wrist joint and we can have adduction at the wrist joint. You must say in which joint the movement is happening. When you look at the hand, for example, you can consider that this is the midline of my hand. Now, if I move my fingers away from the midline, this is abduction. And if I move them closer, that is adduction. Guys, these are my scapulas. And now you're looking at me posteriorly and the midline would be right there. If 
I move my scapulas closer to the midline. This is adduction. Okay? So I'm adding my scapulas together. If I'm moving them away from the midline, that is abduction. Okay? So adduction and abduction. Now you're looking at me from a side view. And the imaginary line is crossing exactly at the middle, right? Now, when I go and I move my forearm like this, can you notice that I'm folding at the elbow joint? This movement of folding is called flexion. The definition of flexion is when we have the angle between the bones in the articulation decreasing. But the easy way to remember is, if you remember, flexion folds. So, here we have flexion at the elbow joint. Now, the movement that takes my forearm back to the midline is extension. Okay? So, extension is the opposite of flexion. So, here is flexion at the elbow joint. Here is extension at the elbow joint. If we look at the shoulder joint, flexion at the shoulder joint, this is extension at the shoulder joint. But you know that we are capable of moving our upper limb even further back than the midline. And when we go further back, this is hyperextension. So, flexion, extension when it goes back to the midline. And if we're passing the midline, this is hyperextension. Obviously, we cannot have hyperextension at the elbow joint because the ulna blocks, so gets stuck within the fossa that we have in the humerus bone. Now, let's fold things in our lower limb. The hip joint. When we fold at the hip joint, this is flexion at the hip joint. If we bring it back, this is extension at the hip joint. And when we are moving it further back, so we pass the imaginary line, this is hyperextension at the hip joint. Let's look at our knee. We fold at the knee. Oh, that's posterior now. This is flexion at the knee joint. When we are coming back to the imaginary line, this is extension at the knee joint. Now, you can do like this. And this, I'm folding my body. And I'm folding at the intervertebral joints. So, this movement is flexion at the intervertebral joints. And when I'm coming back, this is extension at the intervertebral joints. Now, you know that I can go even further. I can pass the midline. And when I go even further, this is hyperextension at the intervertebral joints. If we look at our neck, this is the imaginary line. We are flexing, so this is flexion at the neck. This is extension at the neck. And this is hyperextension at the neck. And now we are back at the midline. The joint that we have articulating right here in our neck would be the joint between the occipital bone and the atlas, which is C1, and also the intervertebral joints. So, we just mentioned at the neck because it makes it simpler, okay? We can have flexion and extension at the wrist. Guys, we, this is the midline. Let me go back to the position. This is the midline. Now, we fold flexion at the wrist. We go back, this is extension at the wrist. Can we pass the imaginary line? Yes, we can. This is 
hyperextension at the wrist joint, okay? Now, when you look at the fingers, what happens? We can flex our fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joint. We can extend our fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joint. And this is all in relationship to the imaginary line. So you flex at the metacarpophalangeal joint and you extend your fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joint. This is the imaginary line. And you know that we can go like this. So if we go like this, guys, we are not moving a part of our body away from the imaginary line. We are literally moving the imaginary line with us. And when we are moving the imaginary line with us and you are folding, you see, you're folding this Folding is happening lateral, right? So this is called lateral flexion at the intervertebral joints. Now, look at this. Pay attention to my feet. Can you notice that my feet are already folded? They are at 90 degrees angle when comparing to the imaginary line. So, if my feet are already folded, they are already flexed. And that's why for the foot, we have the foot moving at the ankle joint. Up, this is one flexion, and down, that's another flexion. When you're moving up, which is bringing your foot closer to the dorsal of your foot, which this is the dorsal part. This is called dorsiflexion. When you are folding your foot down, so you are planting something in the floor, this is plantar flexion. So for your foot, your foot is already folded from the beginning. You have just flexion. You have either dorsiflexion or plantar flexion at the ankle joint. Okay? Now I needed to focus on my feet. In anatomical position, the sole of our foot touches the floor. However, we know that we are capable of having the sole of our foot facing the inside, and this is called inversion. And we can also have the sole of our foot facing the external. And that's called eversion. So, inversion, the sole of our foot faces the inside. Eversion, the sole of our foot faces the external. Now, usually these movements happen in an exaggerated manner when we twist our ankle. However, these movements do not happen at the ankle joint. They do not happen at the joint between the talus, the tibia, and the fibula. The inversion and eversion movements happen in joints between the tarsal bones. So, these movements of inversion and eversion happen at the intertarsal joints. Another movement is like this, like a circle, and guess what this was named? Circonduction. So, we have circonduction at the shoulder joint, we can have circonduction at the hip joint, we have circonduction in the metacarpophalangeal joint. If we are rotating something in an axis, that's not circonduction, okay? So, look at this. This is the imaginary line. What I am doing is I am moving my head laterally. This is called lateral rotation. Okay? Look at my hip now. If I move my lower limb like this, look at my foot. When I did this movement, 
I rotate my lower limb externally. And this is called external rotation at the hip joint. Also called lateral rotation at the hip joint because I rotated my lower limb laterally. Now let's go back to the anatomical position. If I move my lower limb like this and I bring it closer to the midline, we then have a medial rotation at the hip joint, also called internal rotation at the hip joint because it moved internally, so the inside of the body. We can also have this movement at the shoulder joint, right? And for you to be able to sit better, I will flex at the elbow. Now, I can move my upper limb laterally, so this is lateral rotation at the shoulder joint. And I can also move my upper limb medially, bring it closer to the midline. And this is medial rotation at the shoulder joint, also called internal rotation at the shoulder joint. And this is external rotation at the shoulder joint. Pronation and supination. And this is the anatomical position. When the palms of our hands are facing anteriorly, so in anatomical position, our forearm is supinated, okay? If you can hold the bowl of soup, you are supinating. Now, if we flip the palms of our hands posteriorly, this is pronation. So now our forearms are pronated. So the movement of bringing the palms of our hands anteriorly is supination. The movement of moving the palms of our hands posteriorly is pronation. As you can see, we have pronation and supination happening because the radius bone, which is always lateral, remember the radius bone is always on the side of the thumb because the thumb is the antenna for the radio. Remember old days radio had antennas? Yes. So this is the radius bone. And if you pay attention, when we pronate, the radius bone rolls over the ulna bone. So pronation and supination happens at the radio ulnar joint, at both proximal radio ulnar joint and distal radio ulnar joint. This one is the proximal radio ulnar joint because this is the one that's proximal to the body right here. And this one is distal because this one is more distant than this one in relationship to the body, okay? Now look at this. When we open our mouth, this is depression because we are depressing. We are putting something down, okay? Depression. Now when we move it back up, when we move our lower jaw, which is the mandible bone, when we move it up, this is elevation. We are elevating it back. And obviously, this happens at this joint that we have between the temporal bone and the mandible. So it happens at the temporal mandibular joint. Now, we can also do this and this. When we move our mandible forward, that's called protraction. Guys, a proactive person is a person that's ahead of the game, right? So the protraction, we are moving our mandible ahead anteriorly. And when we have retraction, we are moving it posteriorly because retro means back. So we are moving your mandible back. Okay, so protraction is anterior and retraction is posterior. And this all happens at the temporal mandibular joint. The last movement we need to talk about is the movement that happens when our thumb 
crosses the palm of our hands and touches all the other fingers. This movement is called opposition and it only happens because the synovial joint that we find between metacarpal one and the carpal bone is a saddle joint. Now, the carpal bone that we have right here is the trapezium. Remember, the trapezium is always under the thumb. Trapezium under the thumb. So, we have the movement of opposition happening at the carpal metacarpal joint. And this opposition movement is what allows us to grasp and manipulate objects very precisely. 